Hi, I'm Dr. Justin Chi, and welcome back to another episode of Chairside Live. Today, Dr. Timothy Kaczynski will illustrate the diagnosis, planning, and treatment for the extraction of maxillary first and second bicuspids with immediate placement Han tapered implants. Let's take a look. The following case presentation illustrates the diagnosis, planning, and treatment for the extraction of maxillary left first and second bicuspids with the immediate placement of the Han tapered implants from Glidewell Direct. Here we have a 61-year-old female who presented to the practice with symptomatic maxillary left first and second bicuspids with failing endodontic treatment. The porcelain of the old PFM, porcelain fused the metal crowns, had fractured. An endodontic evaluation indicated fractures and a poor prognosis for further treatment of the teeth. The patient reported controlled hypertension and anemia. So with no contraindications present, the patient was treatment planned for extractions, grafting, and dental implant placement. Physics forceps from Golden Dental Solutions were used to atraumatically remove the bicuspid teeth. The beak or shovel-shaped edge of the instrument engaged the palatal surface of the root one to three millimeters subgingively. The bumper, the second part of the instrument, was placed onto the facial aspect of the tooth to be removed as high up into the vestibule as possible. The bumper is not a working end of the instrument, but rather simply acts as a fulcrum or center of rotation for the beak. Simple wrist rotation created tension on the palatal root surface. This tension created energy resulting in a physiologic enzymatic response, breaking down the periodontal ligaments. And no squeezing occurred during this process. Rather, their simple rotational force was applied. The tooth was lifted up and out of the socket, thus maintaining the facial plate of bone. The instrument is intended not to remove the tooth in total, but rather to luxate it. A tooth delivery instrument was then used to remove the root structure in total. Visual observation and digital radiography demonstrated that the atraumatic extractions resulted in intact socket sites. However, after more extensive evaluation, it was apparent that there were facial defects on the walls of the socket sites caused by the root fracture and subsequent bone loss. An Orban knife was used to create a controlled incision and an envelope flap was created. A periosteal elevator was used to move the attached gingiva facially, exposing the bony defects and the palatal attached gingiva was also relieved. This was an important step to help maintain a passive position for subsequent placement of the protective membrane. The allograft material was dispensed into a sterile dappen dish. This mineralized cortical cancels allograft blend is well suited for this situation as the range of particular sizes allows for a mixed resorption rate by the osteoclast responsible for bone growth and healing. I personally prefer to wet the allograft material with sterile water. This allows for an ideal handling characteristic when transferring the graft material to the surgical site. Then we trimmed the membrane to a size that covered the defect and engaged healthy bone more than two millimeters past any defect on the facial and palatal aspect. Osteotomies were formed for two 4.3 millimeter diameter Han tapered implants in the areas of tooth number 12 and 13. A 2.4 millimeter twist drill was used to create the initial openings into the bone on the palatal aspect of the sockets. Because some bone recontouring at the crest of the ridge is expected in an immediate extraction site, the osteotomies were created at a depth to position the implants about a millimeter subcrestally into the socket. The twist drill was used to establish ideal mesial distal angulation and proper depth. The 3.5 millimeter diameter shaping drill was used to widen the sites and a radiograph was taken to ensure proper positioning. The osteotomies were completed with the 4.3 millimeter diameter shaping drills. A 13 millimeter long implant was placed into the area 
of the maxillary first bicuspid. Digital radiography confirmed the slightly subcrustal placement of the implant into the socket. A 4.3 millimeter by 11.5 millimeter Han tapered implant was placed in the maxillary second bicuspid site. After threading the implant into position, the facial bone defects were evident. The defects would be corrected using the allograft material and resorbable membrane. The tapered shape and aggressive thread design of the Han tapered implants helped achieve primary stability of 40 newton centimeters. Cover screws were hand tightened into place, which allowed for the folding of the resorbable membrane over the crest of the ridge to protect the graft material on the facial aspect of the implant site. A significant gap between the stable implants and the bony walls of the alveolus was noted. For proper control when placing the bone graft particles, the membrane was passively positioned two millimeters or more past the most apical portion of the facial defects. For this reason, it was imperative that the envelope flap extend significantly beyond the facial defect. I have found that the main error in membrane placement is trying to force the resilient material into a space that will not allow it to seat easily. To maintain consistent bone volume, the mineralized cortical cancellous allograft material hydrated with sterile saline to create a paste-like mixture was placed between the implants and the facially positioned membrane. The membrane was simply tucked over the surgical site to engage the palatal bone a minimum of two millimeters apically. Suturing a membrane graft can be challenging. The cutting needle sometimes grabs onto the membrane and dislodges it. I have found the technique of taking the needle from the crestal to the facial and then reversing the needle and engaging tissue from the crestal to the palatal to be most efficient. A reverse bevel helps avoid catching the membrane as the surgical site was sutured. The post-operative CBCT scan performed using the PAX-I 3D green imaging system from Vatec America indicated that the two implants were optimally positioned. The sutures were removed after approximately seven days and the implant sites were allowed to heal for another four months. The patient then presented for final impressions. The transfer copings engaged the inside of the implants and a radiograph was taken to make sure the metal-to-metal -metal components seated properly. Note that there was an excellent band of attached gingiva on the facial aspect of the implants, and the bone contour appeared to be proper. The final impression was made using vinyl polysiloxane material. From this impression, a master cast was made from Glidewell Laboratories, and they fabricated custom titanium abutments. The final Single unit crowns were digitally designed and milled from Bruxer full strength solid zirconia. The custom mill titanium abutments were threaded into position in the healthy grafted implant site. The Bruxer crowns were cemented over the custom abutments and exhibited a natural aesthetic appearance. So in conclusion, the most important aspects of immediate implant placement and eventual final aesthetic reconstruction can be summarized as follows. Number one, minimize extraction trauma. Maintain as much bone as possible. Two, utilize minimally invasive surgical techniques. The tissue can typically be controlled with simple envelope flaps. Number three, initial stability is critical and can be maximized by selecting a tapered implant with an aggressive thread design. Number four, when facial defects are present, proper grafting techniques can ensure optimal contours and ridge preservation for the implant restoration. And finally, number five, custom abutments can be utilized to control the margins and aesthetics of the final restoration. So with proper techniques, predictability can be achieved in dental implant integration, attached gingival health, and final prosthetic excellence. Thank you so much, Dr. Kaczynski, for that interesting case presentation. On behalf of everyone here at the lab, thank you for watching Chairside Live, and we'll see you back here next time.